Alex, I'm sorry if I mischaracterized. Would you say you're more of an algebraist than a topologist or algebraist? Okay, Alex is an algebraist. I apologize for that. Um, so, so Matthew is, uh, 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 less importantly, he's a, a professor at the Niels Bohr Institute, but more importantly, he's my cousin. And, uh, and that's, that's the, the most important thing on his resume. And today he's going to be telling us about Feynman integrals. And with that, I'll immediately pass the stage over to you. So uh, Matthew, the stage is yours. I've made you a co-host. You can share screen if you'd like. And thank you very much for joining us today. Indeed, awesome, yeah. Okay, cool. So can everyone see my slides now? Okay, great. And hopefully the cursor as well. If not, describe where I'm pointing. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. So um, yeah, so indeed, uh, thanks to Max for inviting me to give this talk. It's always sort of fun to reach out to a different audience. Um, I will say that I gave sort of a similar talk like this to a bunch of mathematicians. Now, I know that you guys are sort of a mix of mathematicians and computer scientists who maybe have slightly different interests. But I think you share one important trait in common, which is why I'm starting this talk with a warning. Um, you almost certainly like it when things are well-defined, yes? Things in this talk will not always be well-defined. They are going to eventually be well-defined. So I will begin this talk by describing things without defining them very much. And that's just because there's a lot of physics background that would be really tedious to go through and would mean I wouldn't be able to talk about anything actually new. Um, but in the middle of the talk, I will actually start defining things properly, and you will be able to follow along at that point. And before then, hopefully, the nice pictures I draw will be appreciated by people who can appreciate nice pictures, even if they don't always have nice definitions. Okay. So with that out of the way, um, I should probably first describe what I do and thus why Max thought this would be interesting. Um, so I study what are called scattering amplitudes. So these are a piece that we use to calculate the probability of particle collisions. So if you've got you know, some machine like the Large, Large Hadron Collider tossing a pair of protons together, um, we're trying to calculate the chance that, say, two quarks from those protons collide and make a Higgs boson, or that these two collide and instead um, make two photons and have to distinguish when they're just making two photons versus when they're making two photons because it's a Higgs boson. So all sort of things like that that we're using to kind of calibrate our predictions, make sure the theory actually describes reality. Um, so the scattering amplitude is this thing that I usually use this curly letter A for. Um, and it's called an amplitude for sort of vague reasons, but basically it's similar it's got a similar rule to the amplitude of the wave function in, quant in normal quantum mechanics. And in particular, in both cases, what you need to do is square this thing for its absolute value, its complex valued. So square it times complex conjugate, integrate it over, this is an integral over solid angle. So it's just integrating over the different angles these particles take. And you get something called a cross section. And you can think of a cross section really as like as if you were firing a particle with a literal target. Like it's just sort of a round target sitting there. What's the area that target has that corresponds to how likely you are to hit this other particle? So you multiply this by the number of particles you're shooting per area, and you get the chance that something happens. And we measure this in units called barns, um, because the original people designing this wanted sort of a unit for like a uranium nucleus, which they thought was really easy to hit. So they said uh, hitting the broad side of a barn. So a barn is roughly the size of uranium. Okay, so we're trying to calculate these things. And you may have sort of heard vague descriptions of how quantum field theory works, um, in which you might have heard the phrase path integral. So in principle, these path integrals are what we're supposed to calculate. And the rough idea of them is that they're an integral over all possible paths between one situation, say two protons coming in towards each other, and another situation, say a Higgs boson showing up in the detector. The integral is then weighted by something called an action. This is an integral over a Lagrangian. I'm using these words just because I know that some CS people do optimization and optimization people know what Lagrangians are. 
But if you haven't heard of any of those things, don't worry, it doesn't really matter for this talk. Um, now this thing looks extremely ill-defined when I just present it like this. It is not quite that ill-defined, it is still ill-defined. Um, and in particular, these can only really be computed precisely in very simple cases. In particular, the case of free particles. So if you've got some particle that doesn't interact with anything else, then we calculate this easily. We know exactly how to do it. What that means is that in practice, we don't actually want to do this. And what we do instead is what's called perturbation theory. So we can solve for the free theory where the particles don't interact. And then what we do is we add on corrections in the, this interaction. And we can assume that this interaction is relatively small. So there's some constant G parameterizing how strongly the particles interact with each other. And you get terms based on how far you want to go in this expansion. Now, the coupling is not always small in nature. Sometimes it's large. If it's large, you have to do something else. Um, the thing people do is simulate things on a grid. It's a very, I guess, reasonable thing to do for someone who's used to using computers. That's called lattice QCD. I don't do it. There's actually another Vaughn that does this. So if you are interested in this, you can ask, ask to talk to his other relatives and you will find someone who does. Um, but I don't do that. There's also various special cases where you can sort of sneakily calculate this some other way. But I'm gonna focus on this, perturbations. And to calculate in these perturbations, a trick that we use is these things called Feynman diagrams. So this is also something maybe you've just seen you know, on the back of a napkin or t-shirt or whatever. Um, these kind of pictures of particle physics processes. And really, what these pictures are deep down is just a trick to let us organize this perturbation theory. So every line in this diagram, every edge in this graph corresponds to the free particle solution. So this is just to calculate if the particle isn't interacting at all. And then every time the lines meet, so every vertex of the graph, that corresponds to some way that these things interact. And then what you draw is you start out with whatever initial particles you have, look at what final particles you're looking at. So you're trying to calculate some specific probability. Two things collide, two things come out. And you just try to draw all the connections you can with all the vertices that your theory gives you. So your theory tells you which interactions you're allowed to do and thus which vertices you can draw on your graph. So you connect these starting edges in all possible ways. And those are your Feynman diagrams. And of course, in principle, there's a lot of these things. There's infinitely many, right? They can just out of this, these you know, elements, this type of edges, these type of vertices, I could draw an infinite number of graphs. But luckily, in practice, we only have to consider some of them. Um, I'll actually explain that element a little bit later. Uh, but OK, it's kind of coming up now. So what these diagrams do is they tell you how to do this perturbation theory. So in particular, there are what are called Feynman rules. So each edge and each vertex gets translated into some formula. So each edge gives you what's called a propagator that has to do with the free particle solution of this theory. In the simplest case, so this is what's called a scalar particle, um, you just get one over p squared minus m squared, where p is the momentum of the particle and m is the mass of the particle. And in the simple case, these interactions are just g squared, where g is that coupling constant from earlier, that thing we're expanding in. Now, if the diagram has non-trivial cycles, and physicists are weird, we call these loops. I know that's not what a loop is in graph theory. For those of you who know graph theory, it's a totally different terminology. We're annoying like that. We started it before we were paying attention to real graph theory. Now we're stuck. Um, 
this is a loop according to and because there's a loop the momenta in it are not fully determined right so let's say i know the momenta going in and i know the momentum going out i know something about this loop momentum but not everything there's an undetermined parameter and whenever there's an undetermined parameter the prescription here we integrate over it and that's what we call feynman integrals now I'll warn you that you might hear someone use another term for Feynman integral. Some people call the path integral I showed you a Feynman integral. It's just different people use different terms for different things. But my community tends to call these things Feynman integrals. Ah, and so this is the point that I was foreshadowing earlier and just forgot the order of my slides. Um, at each order in this coupling constant, you have one more loop. As long as this constant is small, which we were hoping it was, that means you only need to consider a few diagrams before you're up to the point where experimental precision is exceeded and you just can't detect the difference. There are some experiments that are extremely precise. So there are experiments for um, the quantum theory of electricity and magnetism that have been tested to 10 decimal places. Um, so the coupling constant for electromagnetism here is roughly 1 over 137. So to get to 10 decimal places, you need five factors of this. So that's five loops. Some things are less precise. At the LHC, usually you want 1%, and that's about as good as the experiment is right now. That's even a little better, but it will get there once it gets more data. So that's, that's the goal, usually, is to get, get to the 1% level. That's the goal right now. And that's different requirements for different forces. So the weak nuclear force is even weaker than electromagnetism. So even sort of one loop there is already very difficult for something like the LHC to see, but still relevant for these extremely precise tests. Gravity is just totally invisible. It's absurdly small at these kinds of particle physics scales. The strong nuclear force is the opposite problem. Its constant is actually close to one. Uh, the situations in the Large Hadron Collider, there's effective reasons why the constant's a bit smaller, which makes it so we can still work with it, but it's still big. It's like a third or a tenth. It's, so in principle, we still have to have several loops before we get to the 1% level. OK. So I figured I'd just show you a simple one of these calculations, just to give you a feeling for what it's actually made of, what it looks like. And I'm going to start with a simple diagram. I'm going to do this scalar theory thing, so just the type of edges and vertices I showed you before. And I'm going to take the mass to zero, so the massless scale, just to make things super simple. OK. And I'll draw this diagram that I showed you earlier. So two particles come in. There's a loop, which, yes, I know is a cycle, but we call it a loop. And there's two edges going out. The first step, we label the momentum. So these P1, P2, P3, P4, that's the incoming and the outgoing momenta. That's something we know going in or that we're trying to predict. Then in this loop, we know these two sides of the loop have to be related but we know there's some undetermined momentum. We call that K. So that's going to be the momentum in the loop. We have to integrate then over it. Once we have these labels, then follow those Feynman rules I mentioned and insert factors. I'm going to ignore the external edges. There's sort of a procedure for that. The internals are the ones that matter because we're doing an integral. So there's a K squared here, and there's K plus P1 plus P2 quantity squared here. And because there's two Cs, each one with a G squared, we have G to the fourth. So we want to do this integral. I'm going to be sloppy with overall factors, just to warn you. So this G to the fourth is going to disappear in a moment, I think. Um, and there's various pies, which I'm just throwing under the rug. They sometimes matter. They don't matter for this discussion. Now, this integral turns out to be divergent. It's not actually a well-defined integral to begin with, just this one, not even the path integral, just this one. So we're going to regularize it. And we're going to regularize it by doing something that sounds like bullshit. We're going to take the dimension to from 4 to 4 minus 2 epsilon. 
where epsilon is small. So our dimension is now real value. We actually are going to treat it maybe even as complex value, but it's definitely real value, not integer. Okay, why the fuck would you do that? Well, sometimes perfectly sensible things you want to calculate turn out to be divergent. There's actually a whole deep story here about what's really going on. Um, it's called renormalization. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about it here, but basically we can hide the divergence in observations. We know that these fundamental constants I've been putting in, these strength of interaction, the mass of the particle, those things we only know because we measure them. But when we measure them, what we're really measuring is the effect of all of those different diagrams that look to be divergent. So essentially, we just hide the divergence in there. We say, OK, what really this constant is, is whatever we measure minus infinity, where infinity corresponds to the diagrams. And we only have to do that a few times in a few of these fundamental constants in order to predict everything else. We don't have to keep eating. Eventually, the diagrams give something that makes sense. We just have to cheat a couple times. Anyway. For just the calculational question, the point is now we have something divergent, we want to regularize it. Uh, so someone's raising their hand, it looks like. Uh, do you want to ask your question? Go ahead. Yeah, so we are not treating constants as constants. Right, or rather they're, uh, they're going to be constant with respect to, I guess the point is they're not sort of given, in the context of this talk, they will still be treated as constants. In general, in physics, they're not going to be given to you. They're something you have to derive from experiment, and that has to be compared with what you actually calculate. So that's sort of the story. OK. In the end, we do want to, however, uh, get back to the original constants that we started with, right? Essentially, yeah. Or rather, I mean, again, I, I think there's sort of a temptation to say, like, OK, there's some you know, real electric charge out there in the universe. But really, the only thing we know about it is what we can measure. Um, yeah. So really sort of what we need to do is sort of calibrate the calculations such that whenever we calculate the thing that directly corresponds to the electric charge, it gives what we actually measure is the electric charge. Okay. And the trick is that once you do that, you can then calculate, say, some more complicated question, like what happens when two electrons bounce off each other? What angles do they have? And you match reality completely to 10 decimal places. Okay. Thank you. OK. Yeah, so then, but again, this is sort of the step before that, where we just want to calculate these integrals, and we need some way to regularize them in order to do any of this song and dance in the first place. And it turns out there's a bunch of different ways to regularize. So this dimensional thing is just one of the options. There's two types of divergences. Your integral can diverge when the momentum is large, or it can diverge when the momentum is small. We call the divergences when the momentum is, um, I guess I'll start with small ones. We call these infrared divergences, or IR. Now, in principle, this is a lot lower energy than just the infrared. This is infinitely small energy. But we call it infrared because it's kind of that direction. As opposed to the other one, when the momentum is large, we call that UV or ultraviolet. So that's when the momentum is large. And you might think that sort of the simplest thing you could do is just cut off your integral. Just say, OK, there's some minimum momentum if there's an IR divergence. Indeed, you can do this. It's feasible, it's, though I'll, as I'll describe in a second, it's not usually what we do. For infrared divergences, you can also add masses to your theory. So if there's some massless particles, um, if you make them massive, that can often cure these kinds of problems. For UV divergences, when the momentum is large, you could cut off things on the other side. You could say, OK, the momentum can only get so large and no larger. You can also do another trick with masses. So this one's more complicated. It's got a name, Pauli Villars. And the idea with this trick is that you can take the calculation you were doing and subtract the calculation with some very, very large mass in the particles. 
that very large mass means that your integral is dominated by these large masses everywhere except when the momentum is also large. So it cancels in exactly the part where these two would have a problem and everywhere else it's finite and it gives the original value. And dimensional regularization is nice because it solves both of these problems. And the idea of dimensional regularization is that you need to write your integral in a different way in which the dimension is no longer just a number of integrations, but instead it's some adjustable parameter. You then let that adjustable parameter be real valued and you will run expand around the dimension you're interested in. So this is a phantom with some divergent term. But they're explicit one over epsilon factors and one over epsilon squared. And that means you can just put those, say, in the constants that you're trying to, that you're interested in, um, in order to do this renormalization trick. Now, this seems quite a bit more weird than just cutting things off. But unlike just cutting things off, it works for both directions. Also, it doesn't screw up special relativity. This is important. If you just cut things off, that's not going to look the same if someone's in a different reference frame, if someone's going too fast. So if you want to actually make special relativity work, then you need something more like this. It also just means you're not adding some weird arbitrary masses that you just pulled out of your hat. So how do you do this kind of thing in practice? Well, like I said, you need to rewrite your integral in a different way, write it in terms of different um, integration variables. And so you introduce what are sometimes called Feynman parameters, or sometimes called semantic parameters, or sometimes called alpha parameters. The reason for the different names is that Feynman and semantic hated each other, and each one claimed they invented these first. So the people who want to be neutral just call them alpha parameters because they're usually called alpha. So for each edge in the diagram, you introduce one of these alphas. And you just use this kind of formula. So the 1 over p squared minus m squared goes up into an exponential, and you introduce a new integration over this alpha. So you do this for all these edges. Here are just two of them, so alpha 1 and alpha 2. And now you can maybe notice that this exponential here, it's got k squared in it, so it's a Gaussian. And you can do a Gaussian. So you can integrate out this extra momentum. And when you do that, you get something like this. So now I've introduced this S12 thing here. Um, this is just a sum of the momenta flowing into this diagram squared. Uh, it's called a momentum invariant. So the nice thing about this is that it's invariant under special relativity. And this is sort of a cute way of showing that this diagram as a whole makes sense even if you're traveling in some other reference frame. Even if you're traveling much faster than these particles, you can do the same calculation and still get a sensible result. OK. And now, as you see, number of integrations is just two integrations. It's integer in number of integrations again. But now the epsilon shows up instead um, here in this exponent. In practice, if we want to do this integral, we next take a step to make the integral projective. So we integrate out an overall scale. And we now get some expression that's got some simple polynomials in these alphas with some exponents depending on this epsilon. This weird symbol here is just saying that we've got a delta function here, or alternatively, that this is a projective integral. And finally, you can do this integral in terms of what are called gamma functions. So for those who haven't seen them before, gamma functions are just a way to analytically continue um, the, the factorial. So gamma of z is z minus 1 factorial for positive integer z. And for other values, it's given by this kind of integral formula. So this is just some compact way to write this. But if we want to be less packed, we can expand an epsilon. And the reason to do this is this lets you isolate the part that's divergent, the part that's finite, and the part that goes away as epsilon vanishes. 
So you can see a one over epsilon. So like I said, this is a divergent diagram. We have to hide it somewhere if we were doing real field with it. It's got some finite pieces, including a logarithm of this uh, momentum invariant that I mentioned of the momentum flowing in. And then it's got some, at higher order, it's got some log squareds and this uh, zeta two where zeta here is the Riemann zeta function. So I'm not expecting you to remember all of the details of that, but there's a couple things I kind of wanted to highlight. One of them is just in general, the way this works. You start with these alphas and that gives you an integral in projective space. You have a bunch of functions that show up here. Here there's some logs of the various momenta in the problem. And you have some numbers, including pi squared over six, which I've sneakily written as the Riemann zeta function evaluated at two. And the reason why will become apparent in a few slides. Now, the reason why I'm highlighting this stuff is that most of that story generalizes. You can take a really complicated diagram, do the same thing, and you get some integral in projective space over a bunch of different alpha parameters of a ratio of polynomials to these weird S epsilon dependent exponents. And now these polynomials can be defined purely in terms of the graph. So not in terms of the particles of the theory, just the graph itself. They're called graph polynomials. Um, so one of them involves all of the trees that span the graph. The other involves all pairs of, tree, of two uh, disconnected trees that together span the graph. And once again, there's a lot of detail here that I don't need you to remember, but just there's a system for this and it's now nice and well-defined and graph theoretic. Now, the question then is, if you do these integrals, what happens? What do you find? Well, the simple answer is you get what are called periods. So a period is a specific type of complex number. It's a complex number where both its real and imaginary parts can be written as integrals of an algebraic function with algebraic coefficients over a domain defined by polynomial inequalities with algebraic coefficients. So these things are kind of cute. They're countable. Um, they include most of the transcendental numbers that one finds interesting. They include pi. They include all of the values of the Riemann zeta function, all of the values of it in, in, at integers, I mean. Right. So they include a lot of useful, interesting stuff. Um, they're sort of this thing that lives in between the reals and the algebraic numbers. Um, and there's a theorem. Uh, this one's by some physicists, Bogner and Weinzerl, that provided certain conditions hold. Indeed, every one of these Feynman integrals that you calculate, all of the terms in its expansion in epsilon are going to be periods of this under this definition. And if you're curious what sort of periods, well, I've stolen this slide from a mathematician who studies these things just show you a few diagrams. So these are diagrams where there are no particles coming in or out because they're just giving numbers. Um, so they're just graphs. This one gives six times the Riemann zeta function evaluated at three. This one's 20 times the zeta function evaluated at five and so on. You get sometimes strange looking rational numbers times zeta function evaluated at the integers. And eventually they start getting more complicated. So here are some products of zeta function evaluated in integers. If you keep going, you get even more than that. It, you get what are called multiple zeta values. So there's a generalization of the Riemann zeta function called the multiple zeta function, where now you've got a, a, a multiple sum over these n's to exponents s, which are the arguments of your function. And if those s's are integers, these things are called multiple zeta values. And these show up in a lot of different Feynman diagrams. Now, 
those are what happens when you just get numbers. You also sometimes will get functions. If you get a function, um, here's an example of sort of one of the simpler ones. This is a triangle diagram. The particles are all still massless. Um, and now, uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, and now we've got three momenta here. And we get some kind of complicated looking function of all of these momenta where these are just logs, but these are what are called dialogs, dialogarithms. The dialogarithm can be thought of as an integral dt over t of log one minus t. Now, it turns out those also show up in much more generality. So there are these things that are called multiple polylogarithms or hyperlogarithms or Physicists sometimes call them Goncharov multiple polylogarithms. There's this one particular mathematician named Goncharov who um, kind of introduced them to physicists. And so we call them after him, even though he definitely didn't invent them. Um, so other mathematicians get mad about this. But again, physicists are bad with names and we'd make up annoying things. That's how we work, apparently. Anyway, uh, these things are these kinds of iterated intervals. So the idea is that you've got this um, vector here of different arguments, these A's. And each time you strip off the last one of these a's and integrate dt over t minus a of the object with one fewer of these. So it's the recursive definition. The recursion start with a vector with no entries, just giving one. And there's a special case that if you've got a vector of zeros, you have log to the power length of that vector. If you want to evaluate these things at special points, you get various different interesting numbers. In particular, if you just have a bunch of ones and zeros in this vector, you get a multiple zeta value. Okay. Now, these things turn out to satisfy a lot of different relations. So just for the dialogue, I can take a sum of these three dialogues of very different arguments, and I get a bunch of dialogues with more simple arguments and the product of logs. So if you just sort of write these things down naively, you're going to have a lot of redundancy. And this annoys us, because we want to know relations between these diagrams. We want to know when two diagrams actually give the same answer, or when two diagrams cancel when there's some weird analytic behavior that cancels maybe, or maybe when the divergence cancels. So we really want to understand what all of these relations are. And, and luckily, there's some at least conjectures that say that these relations for these multiple polylogarithms should be very nice and easy to handle. So mathematicians seem pretty confident about this conjecture that multiple polylogarithms are all transcendental functions. That is, if you give an algebraic argument, they will give you a transcendental number. This is not proven. Um, in fact, it's not even proven for the Riemann zeta function itself. If you evaluate the Riemann zeta function for an even number, you get some power of pi with some rational coefficient. So that's transcendental. But if you evaluate it for an odd number, um, it isn't even proven that, uh, that I think zeta three is transcendental. It's, I think, proven irrational, but not transcendental. So there's a surprising amount not known about these things, but mathematicians are still very confident this should be the case, which I suppose is rare that something's that conjectural and still that confident. Now, what you can do is you can define a notion of weight. So you can say that the length of these, this vector that we use to define these functions, that's the weight of the function. And the product of things has a weight that's equal to the sum. So pi squared times zeta 3, pi squared is weight 2, zeta 3 is weight 3. So this should have weight 5. And the conjecture is that this notion of weight is preserved by all relations between these functions. So what we're looking for in the end then are relations that have rational coefficients between things of the same weight, 
and everything else should be taken into account by these products. And luckily it turns out that you can kind of make this sort of thing work. So you can take a derivative of some of these functions, you get a function of lower weight times a rational function, right? So you take a derivative of the dialog, you get log one minus z times one over z. And you can use this to recursively define something called a symbol. So the symbol of the dialog doing this recursion is the symbol of log one minus z tensor z. And the symbol of, of log is just its argument. So the symbol of the dialog is minus one minus z tensor z. And you can do this more broadly using these definition with these derivatives to get longer and longer tensor products for different lengths of these um, multiple poly logarithms. So the length of this vector of arguments is going to give you the length of these tensor products in your, in your symbol. And the cute thing about this is that each term in the symbol is sort of representing a logarithm. And because of that, the relations between them are now very, very simple. They're just the relations between logarithms and everybody knows what those are. And physicists find this extremely helpful. So here's sort of the example that got physicists first paying attention to this. These three guys, Del Duca, Durer, and Smirnov, were trying to calculate something involving six particle scattering in a toy model. Six particles in this case means you can have two particles coming in and four particles going out. We call that six particles because it turns out you can use the same formula for other situations like three particles coming in and three going out, as long as the total number is the same. Basically, you can rotate your Feynman diagrams and they still make sense. So they calculated this, they worked this out. And what they found is it took 17 pages as in not doing the calculation, but just writing the answer. The answer, if they tried to express it, was 17 pages. And that seemed like kind of a mess. And they were already you know, doing a lot of sort of smart things to simplify. But what happened is that um, some physicists, Mark Spradlin, Anastasia Volovich, and Christian Vergu, um, looked at this and they said, OK, we got to find a way to make this simpler. Luckily, nearby was this mathematician I mentioned before, Goncharov. And they asked him, and he told them about the symbol. And with the symbol, they figured out they could actually write this on two lines. So this is this 17-page thing. There's some notation, these L4s that are compressing things a little bit. But I could write the definitions for these things in just another couple lines. So it really becomes much more compact, much simpler just from kind of using the fact that you understand all the relations between these things and can write them in a sensible basis. Now, it turns out you can even go a bit farther than that. You can use that structure and use to guess what happens at higher loops. So we call this a bootstrap method. We use what we've observed at, low, at lower orders and basically just start with some onsets, constrain it down with various information we've gotten various other ways and try to get what the answer is with more loops. I ended up spending a few years just diving down this particular rabbit hole. For the three loop expression, um, we did put it into LaTeX just to see how long it was. It was 800 pages long. So that's, you know, size of one of the Game of Thrones books perhaps maybe two of them, depending on how you do it. Um, my, uh, one of my collaborators at the time was writing his thesis, and he joked that he made his thesis 800 pages shorter just by deleting one equation. We kept going. We did four loops. We did five loops. At the point of five loops, it now takes a 300 megabyte text file, so I have no idea how long it is in pages, because I suspect if I dumped it into a LaTeX, it wouldn't compile it would crash. Um, and now we're up to seven loops. So these things get huge, even knowing that you can simplify them a bit. Okay. 
So that's one of the things that we kind of use this stuff for is trying to do these ridiculous calculations. And I should say that those are still in a toy model. In the real world, it's very hard to do that kind of thing, but we're making progress. Now I'll show you one, I'll show you a couple more of these kind of cute little conjectures. This one is more of a physicist conjecture. The conjecture is that there's a maximum transcendental weight at any given loop order. The way I'm expressing it here is in four minus two epsilon dimensions, the coefficient of epsilon to the K for L loops has multiple poly logarithms at most weight 2L plus K, no higher. Um, so if you have no divergences, and if you're not looking at other orders in epsilon, we're talking weight two times the loop. So that means at one loop, you can have dialogues, but you can't have trilogues. You can't have anything with, or you can't have zeta three at one loop. At two loops, though, you could, and you could even have zeta four. At three loops, you can have six, etc. This has been proven in a few very specific cases. But for the most part, it's just an observation. It's something that's true for every calculation we've ever done. And we still don't know why it should hold in general. We can't prove it. I've got a particular favorite theory, this toy model I mentioned before, where this also appears to be a lower bound, where at every loop, it's exactly 2L plus K and epsilon to the K in L loops. Nothing higher, nothing lower. So at four loops, you can't have zeta three either, just zeta four. Again, we still don't know why that's true. And again, we still don't have any proof it's true, but everything we've calculated seems to obey this. And finally, I wanna give one conjecture that turns out to be false. There were people for a while who thought that perhaps all Feynman integrals could be written in terms of these multiple poly logarithms. That would be very nice. We knew all, we could know all the relations, we could write down the symbol, we could simplify things to our heart's content. It would be lovely. It's not true. Some integrals, the simplest ones that are not multiple poly logarithms, involve elliptic curves. The simplest one is what we call the sunrise integral. So here's an integral, it's still scalars, but now we've added some masses. So there's mass one, mass two, mass three. And I can write here, this thing in just in terms of one of these polynomials. So it just has one graph polynomial in it because the other one is exponent zero. And this thing has the momentum flowing in and the masses, and it has this cubic in these alpha parameters. And this cubic, defines an elliptic curve. And it turns out that once you've got an elliptic curve like this, you cannot write your answer in terms of multiple poly logarithms. It's no longer possible. Luckily, there is a formalism that can sort of do the same kind of things. So there's something called elliptic multiple poly logarithms. And there is also a symbol for these things. So we can kind of work with them and kind of make things work. It's tough. It doesn't quite give everything we like, but it's getting there. But things get even weirder, actually. So I don't know if any of you have heard of Calabi Yau manifolds before. Uh, maybe the algebraist slash someone Max thought was a topologist in the audience knows something about them. Um, so these things are, these showed up in string theory originally. There are ways that they curl up the extra dimensions of space and time. It, this is a totally different context, but the same geometries show up. So these are multi-dimensional geometries with some particular special conditions. And it turns out if you go to higher loops in the sunrise, you start getting Calabi-Yau manifolds of higher and higher dimensions as you go higher in loops. What I've found, over the last couple of years is there are a lot of these things. They show up in all sorts of calculations in all sorts of weird ways. And pretty consistently, they seem to be Calabi Yau manifolds. We don't know why, and we don't know what to do with them. We don't know how to derive relations between them. We don't know how to guess features of them or figure out what kind of behavior they have when we change the momenta. 
they're just these mysterious diagrams that give mysterious results. Hmm. Okay. So I think now I actually have run through all the stuff I was going to say. So I'll sort of leave up a slide with some further reading if people are interested um, and otherwise open things up for questions. Uh, but thanks for having me. It was fun. Fantastic. Thank you, Matthew, uh, Matt. For Do you go by Matt or Matthew? I, sh I should Matt know. usually. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Um, and uh, I, we're, we're open to questions. So if, if anybody has a question, please just go ahead and unmute and uh, uh, ask away. Uh, <clears throat> at one point, uh, at the very beginning, you said that if I understood it correctly, it sort of hinges on uh, algebraicity of ratios of uh, parameters. Uh, mm, and yes. uh, physically, is there some physical uh, um, uh, justification for that? Why, sh why should these ratios? <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I mean, in, in reality, these ratios are going to be, you're going to take any value they might like, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. not, there isn't any sort of special condition that says they have to be integer or algebraic or anything like that. Um, what this is more is a statement of properties of these functions. So it's the idea that you can think of these functions as like a family of, um, of transcendental numbers, particular type of periods. And again, it doesn't just define this family, it defines a bunch of things that are not periods, but you don't need to necessarily consider those if you're just interested in its properties. It'd be fun if nature cared about algebraic things, but I don't think it does. Mm -hmm. Alex, would you like to ask a question? Yes, if I may. <clears throat> so the appearance of the values of the zeta function at integer points is very interesting. Uh, there's been fantastic work uh, in the early 70s by uh, Burrell, uh, Serre, and Harder, who showed that at least some of those values can be computed as Euler characteristics of arithmetic groups. Hmm. So I was curious whether uh, this purely physical theory really ties up with <laughs> arithmetic groups. What is the... Yeah, off the top. Yeah, off the top of my head, I have no idea, but um, it does. It, there is sort of a general principle here, which is that these it's usually useful to think of these as the volume of something or the Euler characteristic of something or some, some you know, extensive property or some invariant of some geometric space. So I think that that kind of perspective has been very useful in the past and probably more so in the future. That that's you can right. look at these integrals in general as having this sort of mapping to them. And that's probably much more general than just the ones that turn out to be Zeta values. That's right. In their work, the words, the Euler characteristics appear as um, uh, tied up with the objects of that you encounter in differential geometry. The amazing part is that they also show up from a purely um, number theoretic perspective as mm -hmm. the characteristic of uh, arithmetic groups. So that's mm -hmm. what makes this really so interesting. Now, once you yeah. pass to the algebraic domain, we have uh, tools now that were not available uh, 50 years ago, which has some hope of making new calculations on the algebraic side. Um, it's, it's very interesting. It, maybe we can talk a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, can I ask a question about this epsilon introduction? Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah, hoping sure. you can maybe save me some time because I was thinking about um, 
So you made a comment about how you'd get divergence if you didn't do this, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess my question, and, and it's sort of a naive view from basic undergraduate physics, is this somewhat related to some sort of uncertainty that it's too strict to expect to get the dimension on the dot at four and that you have to introduce this because measurements only really give you within some certain error, or is it just completely unrelated to that? I think it's completely unrelated in this okay. case, yeah. Um, yeah, like the, the dimension is not one of the things that has quantum uncertainty on it, let's put it that way. And physically, we're pretty sure that this is not actually four minus two epsilon dimensions. Um, it really is a regularization trick. It's just a way to make these integrals well-defined enough that we can do this renormalization procedure. Um, but there's ways to define things such that you never encounter these. It's just they're even cumbersome to calculate with. Matt, what, what do you draw the epsilons from? Are they naturals? Are they reals? Or can they be negative? Mm, so it depends a little bit on what you're doing. Um, usually you're going to consider the positive real. Um, in some cases, you're allowed to consider them negative, And there's situations in which it's useful to think about them as complex valued. But um, these are kind of the, the initial introduction of them, usually they're positive reals. You can also kind of uh, just, in, in terms of how they show up in these expansions, it's sometimes good to pretend that they have uh, transcendental weight minus one because they're kind of canceling out, right? These are log squareds and this eta two, this one's just a log. So you can kind of pretend that this is canceling one of the logs. But I mean, that's, it's very a heuristic way of thinking about it. So near the end, you showed all these interesting graphs that you've been encountering. Are there like classes of graphs that one could manufacture on paper, but are not interesting physically or not realizable physically, and therefore can just be scratched out with a red pen? Like, is there any scenario where, where the, the physics allow you to destroy some of the math because it's irrelevant for what you're trying to do? Uh, kind of. So the physics tells you, um, so because each of these uh, vertices represents an interaction, the physics tells you what kinds of vertices you can have. Um, now that varies a lot. So if you're in, if you're just dealing with uh, with quantum electricity and magnetism, with the QED, I should say, um, then you've just got uh, three-point vertices. You don't even have four-point vertices. Um, but if you're introducing gravity, you can actually have vertices of any valence whatever, depending on how you do the calculation. Um, so sometimes, I think there's circumstances in which any in which any graph could potentially show up, but any given theory might only have some of them. Can I quickly ask a question about uh, the, the, this uh, graphical language uh, that you presented? I, so I work in programming languages and uh, we use uh, some, at least some people use, like uh, like to write the, the category theoretical diagrams a lot and including higher categories. So I was wondering if there is any connection, have anyone tried to sort of encode it in more sort of well-known language or it didn't make mm, sense. Category theory language. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do know there's actually someone who's working on categorifying Feynman diagrams. Um, I'm not remembering the name at the moment, but I can look this up. He gave a talk at Lizouche a couple of years back. Um, there's also kind of a Hopf algebra story with these Feynman diagrams. That, that I do know kind of, uh, there's a sort of uh, outer space structure. I don't know if you've heard of that phrase, but uh, that, okay. Um, yeah, I definitely uh, spoke to oh. people who did some uh, hope algebra stuff related to this, but not. Yeah, like Karen Vogt, I think. Or... Yeah. yeah. Uh, could you say it again? What kind of space did you mention? 
Uh, the the term for it is outer space. I don't know kind of what it's. It has nothing to do with, of course, you know, outer space up there. But uh, this is something that uh, Karen Vocht works on, if I'm remembering her name right. Um, me. But I generally do think that the this particular language of Feynman diagrams uh, is the sort of best suited tool for speaking about this the interactions like people have been. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I see like when you use there are some like weird mathematical objects arising from it. So I'm kind of naturally thinking if there is maybe there is a more, you know, suitable uh, kind of representation that would, I don't know, avoid some of the challenges or like those challenges, maybe they're inherent to what uh, to what you're dealing with and there's no way around. I mean, I, I definitely doubt it's inherent and I do think that there's probably, yeah, some nicer trick. I don't, I don't kind of, let me put it this way, it'd be very great to find out. Um, currently, my, my attitude towards these things is that it's often great to avoid Feynman diagrams as much as possible if there's mm -hmm. some other trick to do. So I kind of mentioned these ridiculous you know, three loop, seven loop kind of calculations. Those I didn't use Feynman diagrams for. Um, so that's this bootstrap trick, kind of the whole trick of it is that you get to guess features of the final result without diagrams. Um, so in general, we're always on the lookout for nice kind of ways we can avoid Feynman diagrams and use some different structure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Artem, wouldn't you say that when people use the categorical perspective for similar problems is because they want to use the diagrams because the categorical diagrams allow them to calculate things more easily than doing on paper calculations. Yeah, yeah. The graphs are more easily digestible than equations many times. So I think it's the reason why people, uh, you know, reach to this kind of language, graphical languages, and not only right. in the like in programming languages or whatever. I think the physicists also are pretty happy when you yeah. can explain something. And mm -hmm. at the intersection of both, like this recent Yoneta hacking paper and some of that stuff. Um, so, so, so maybe it's less enticing in physics if you're saying that you don't really want to work with the Feynman uh, diagrams in the first place. Therefore, a, a diagrammatic calculus maybe is not um, ideal for you, Matt. I mean, the, the diagrammatic part of it's fine. The, the problem with Feynman diagrams is that there's kind of a combinatorial explosion of them. Okay. Um, right, because you sort of get more and more just because there's more and more graphs at each number of vertices. Um, so usually we're kind of looking for a way around that that makes there's only a few objects to look at each order. Well, we're uh, solidly at the hour mark. So we've taken a, a good chunk of your time, uh, Matt. So, so thank you very much for, for joining us. If people want to reach out to you, they have like exciting ideas for how to revolutionize Feynman diagrams or, or they want more reading. Uh, should they email you? How should they contact you? Uh, email's great. Um, yeah, I can maybe put the email in the chat or... Sure, I also um, have linked Also, your... I'm sure you can pass it around to people yeah. if they're curious. Yep, yeah. and your page will be linked on our website too. So, awesome. Cool. All right, well, thank you everybody okay. very much for coming. And Matt, thank you for presenting. We really appreciate it. Uh, this recording is going to be online at some point later today. And so if, if people want to refer to it again or look at slides, I'll be able to do that. And everything will be available at our website, which is bstn.cc. Um, so that should be easy to find. Or you can just email me or Matt. Um, so thanks again. And, and uh, uh, Matt, I'll see you in the future. Indeed, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for inviting me. All right, adios. Bye-bye.